In the last verse of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus assures his disciples that he will be with them always until the end of time. His statement was indeed promising, while at the same time prophetic, because he knew. He knew that discipleship would require courage, strength, and an unrelenting faith in his power and his mercy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Discussions on Meade County Catholic Radio, WLHN 95.3 Broadcasting from Brandenburg, Kentucky, I'm Deacon Greg Bevan. Our guests this month, Karen and Tom Beanock, came from a strong faith background, but never in their wildest dreams would they have anticipated the need to rely on that faith to the extent that they have over the past 40 years. Yet, it is that faith that has been their saving grace. When we return, we will hear their amazing story about life, death, and new life. Don't go away. We will be right back. Thank you for listening to Mead County Catholic Radio, an affiliate of EWTN and our monthly talk show, Discussions. Our hope is that these life and spiritual stories from those who live in our parishes and communities will inspire and give hope to you and your faith journey. Remember, you can follow all of our programming by live streaming on our own Mead County Catholic Radio app 24 hours a day, or tune us in at 95.3 FM, broadcasting from Brandenburg, Kentucky. Welcome back to Discussions, and welcome to you, Karen and Tom, and we want to thank you so much for being our guest for this month's show. Thank you for having me. Uh, Tom and Karen, I guess Tom probably first. Many people in our listening audience uh, are, are probably aware of your recent bout with cancer, and before we get into that story, which we will get into those details later, tell us a little bit about how you're doing today. Today I'm doing fine. I'm doing excellent. Um, I've got my strength mostly back. I'm doing really well with that part of it. Emotionally, I'm more stable than I was during the part of the, the cancer ordeal. Um, I'm back to working, farming, able to go hunting. Um, I'm enjoying things that I, I've always enjoyed. I'm able to do that again. And um, I haven't had a treatment for cancer since June 2017. Mm. Mm. So if you say you're back to hunting, this being deer season, I assume you have been deer hunting this year. Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Successful, I assume. Yes, I did. <laughs> Very good. Karen, you have recently had a serious health scare yourself with your heart, um, which you have kept relatively private, and we'll visit with you on that a little later, too. But I understand you're doing much better now as well. Yes, I am. I have a lot more energy now. I don't tire as easily as I did before, and I feel like I've been blessed with a new lease on life. I've been able to resume pretty much my normal activities. Hmm. Well, that's great. Well, let's go back where your lives actually began with each other about 40 years ago. Karen, you were in your second year of teaching. Uh, I think you came from the Scottsville area, the state here in Meade County, and you, but you had just lost your father. And, Tom, you had just begun your farming career with your dad, actually. Then your two hearts met. Take us back to that. Okay, I'll try. Uh, the week we met was a really interesting one. Dad died that week at the age of 60, and he was driving home from work. He had a massive coronary driving down Main Street in Scottsville. He was late getting home from work that day, and he was like clockwork. He always just, uh, I mean, he showed up when he was supposed to. 
Uh, he was late that day, and Mom knew something was wrong. Um, she picked up her purse, and she went over and just sat on the couch and waited. And then she heard a siren, and then a knock at the door, and it was a policeman, and he had come to tell Mom that Dad had been killed in a traffic accident coming home. He had a massive heart attack. He crashed his vehicle into the farmer's deposit bank, uh, driving home, and some people we found out later uh, said that they saw Dad's car driving down Main Street, but they didn't see anyone actually driving it, that I guess he had had his heart attack and he had slumped over in the seat beside him. And um, then he crashed into the bank, just, I don't know if he was trying to get off Main Street or if that's just where the vehicle took him. So um, we buried dad on a Wednesday and then I met Tom two days later on Friday night. And mm. I always felt like that I traded one man for another. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, the story <laughs> of how we met is kind of interesting. It's, it's a little different for me. I, mean, I was at a football game with some of my friends at uh, Mee County High School. And um, I saw Karen standing a distance away and I said something to one of my friends. I said, who's that? And he said, well, I know who it is. And I said, well, what's her name? He said, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> and I said, why? He said, if you want to know her name, you go talk to her. <laughs> so for the first time in my life, I went and talked to a stranger, mm -hmm. introduced myself, talked to her a few minutes, and, uh, you know, and just didn't talk real long. And after that, the ball game, you know, just kind of went our separate ways. And a little later, uh, I called her on the phone, and uh, I called her, and I was talking to her, and, she didn't sound very interested, <laughs> and I, I talked for a little bit. And I thought, well, okay, uh, this isn't going so well. So I said, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to you later. I'll give you a call later. And, and before I said anything, before she hung up, she said, well, make sure you call me back. And I said, well, that's kind of encouraging. Well, after being married and knowing her for a good while, I found out that when she takes a nap, when she wakes up, she doesn't remember anything that she says on the phone. So we got together, and... Uh, we dated for two years, but uh, not too long into the process we were having, I was really thankful that I found out she was Catholic. I, that really made me feel a lot better, and she has made me a lot better person hmm. than I ever was before. Hmm. Well, it sounds like love at first sight certainly applied, but it was a little bit challenging for you, Tom, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I never was very bold before. <laughs> Well, certainly your lives begin to change with your courtship, with the biggest change occurring two years later when you were married on December the 19th, 1981. But as happy as that day was for the both of you, you were faced with a sadness that most couples would never anticipate on their wedding day. Tom, you had just lost your father. My dad died two days before we got married. It was a, We had a, a very short three-hour visitation at the funeral home. Went to the mass, had our mass, had our the meal at the church, and then three hours later, we were back at church doing our wedding rehearsal. Mm. And it was pretty rough. It was rough on me, but it's really, really rough on my mom because at the time, I was still living at home with mom and dad working on getting farming on the farm. And when dad died, it was, she was just almost had emotional. She couldn't do anything. I mean, she just shocked her even though it was expected and it was hard on on her and it's like you know she not only lost her husband but then i'm getting married mm. i'm leaving and she's gonna be alone by her at home by herself for the first time in her life and my dad was 64 years old when he died mm -hmm. amazing I, I can't imagine the emotions that were exchanged through that two-day period it, it was almost Surreal. I mean, I, I don't even think I remember part of it. I really don't think I remember part of it. Yeah. It was like a numb experience. Yeah, it was just, we, we just did the motions. I really think we went through the motions and just tried to get through it at the time. Well, Karen, you and Tom soon settled into your successful careers. You began your family being blessed with two handsome, athletic, and intelligent sons who played college basketball, actually and are now both doctors. But as hectic as your schedules were during those times, one thing remained constant in your lives, and I think you 
probably were implying that a little bit earlier, and that was your faith life. Talk about the role that your faith with each other and within your family played in the Beanock family. Well, Greg, our faith has been a constant in our lives. It's been like a steadying force for us. Uh, we've always attended church regularly every weekend. We've gone on every holy day. We used to say morning prayers with the boys. You know, I would when I was driving them to school. We would say uh, nightly prayers together as a family. Uh, we've always kept holy water in the house and we've always doused ourselves with holy water and even before their ball games and everything, we would bless them with holy water. Uh, we And we've always felt blessed, honestly. Uh, we've never hid our beliefs. We've always been who we are and what we are. And we've, um, we feel like we've been blessed. Uh, we have crucifixes in the house. We have a Fatima statue in the house. And anybody that comes and goes in our, our house knows we are who we are we're going to live our our faith and i guess you know just uh take it or leave it kind of thing you know but that's who we are and that's how we live i was raised catholic of course and went to catholic grade school and we attended mass every sunday as a family at six o'clock mass on sunday morning six o'clock six o'clock <laughs> mass <laughs> that's just that's the way we did my dad he was, always got up early, always did things. We always liked to do that ourselves. Um, we always had that, Karen and I, we've always, every decision we've ever made, we've always prayed to God and had God help us make those decisions. That's something we've always done. And Karen and I, when we go somewhere in the car, we say a rosary and uh, our divine mercy every time we get out in the car and go anywhere. And uh, when the boys were in college, we'd always talk to them on Sunday. And the first question we'd ask, did you go to church? Uh, Thankfully, they always said yes. Hmm. And that when they were growing up, we had a, a saying on our refrigerator. Your talents are God's gift to you. And what you do with those talents is your gift to God. Hmm. And we've always tried to instill that in them, whatever they do. And we do that to ourselves, too. Hmm. Your talents are your gifts from God. And what you do with them is your gift. Your gift. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds to me like you certainly surrounded yourself with Jesus all through uh, those years, and still continue to do that. Oh yes, for yeah. sure. Yeah, Tom, in in your bio, you mentioned that things, and Karen, you do too. Obviously, I mentioned that things weren't always easy. Um, Tom, as a little follow up to that, you had lost a sister to MS. Uh, your mother had passed away too. Uh, Karen, your mother passed away in 2013. Then once again in 2013, Tom, your brother Dickie, lost his 10-year battle with cancer. But before he died, he had a talk with God. And I think that talk, based upon our uh, visiting before, had a big impact on your life in all likelihood. Can you share that with us? Yeah, yes. Dickie, when he first found out he had cancer, he... He loved to fish and he had a boat and he went out to Taylorville Lake one night all by himself, spent the whole night on the lake. Now, he didn't tell me this story, but one of his friends told me this after he died. He went out there and had a long talk and I'm sure it was a long one because he spent the whole night and I'm sure he, you know, he did some good. And it made him feel better, I think. But he told me, his friend told me after he had died, he said, Dickie said, the only thing I did wrong was I didn't ask for enough years. I just asked for 10 years. No kidding. And he said, that's the only thing I did wrong. Hmm. And the other part of this story about him, too, is very good. When he found out he had cancer, a friend of ours mother had gone to Rome, and she had some holy water blessed by the Pope. And before he ever started any of his treatments, she said, I want you to show me every spot that they say you have cancer. So he did. They had already marked his body so they could do the radiation and things. And... Uh, she said, okay, so she made the sign of the cross with the holy water on every spot. Well, after his first treatments, he went back, you know, they had the scan, and he went back to get the results, and the nurse said something, said, this doesn't look right. And Dickie said, wait a minute, what do you mean this doesn't look right? She said, we don't see any scar tissue, we don't see anything that's even said that you've had cancer in those spots. So that, to me, is another sign that God was with him. Mm -hmm. Amazing story. 
Mm. Well, Tom, sickness and illness, especially cancer, have been a part of your family for years, actually. Yet, as surprising as it may seem, you said that you never really thought about getting cancer yourself. When we come back, we'll hear how that changed as you were faced with this terrible disease. And on top of that, that Karen, you had to face a major heart scare, too. We'll be right back. Karen and Tom Beanock have faced many trials in their lives. We thank them for sharing with us their faith and how God has and continues to give them strength and hope through His love and mercy. We also want to thank those who have made this show possible, including Karen and Doug Stiff, Nancy and Ed Tate and Van, Jeanette and Don Hayes, Gwen and Gary Mills, Francis and David Schaffline, the Men's Prayer Group at St. Mary's and St. Teresa's, Jordan and Riley Vida and family, Lois Fackler, and our friends at WMMG. And now, back to discussions. Welcome back to Discussions as we continue our visit with Tom and Karen Beanock as they share their story of life, of death, and new life, and how God has walked with them every step of the way. Tom and Karen, it's now December 2015. Tom, you had had what is now a very common knee replacement procedure, and Karen, not to be outdone by your husband, you followed suit by having one yourself in November of 2016. And Tom, as you accompanied Karen for her first month checkup following her surgery, you happened to mention to her doctor in passing about a soreness in your shoulder. I'm going to let you take it from there. Well, what caused me to to really do that was uh, I was feeding my cows, and I broke some metal on my loader, and I took the tractor to my neighbor's, and I was going to get a sledgehammer try to drive it down where I could weld it. Well, I missed the first two times I didn't do any good. The third time I swung hard, and when I missed, a pain in my shoulder just almost took me to my knees. I had that's the first time I'd felt anything like that. And so, after that, about three or four days later, my shoulder was fine. I could I could use it again. But I thought when she was going to her doctor for her first uh, visit after her surgery, I thought I'd say something to him, knowing he had a good shoulder doctor in her practice with him. So I mentioned it to him. He said, "Well, you." know, you know, you'll have to uh, go get a MRI. So I went and had an MRI done, and uh, then we called back up there when they got the results, and we went in, and we were sitting in our the little room, and the doctor came in and said, uh, Tom, you're gonna have to have another MRI with imaging. And when he said that, Karen said, why with imaging? He said, I've never seen anything that big in a shoulder before. So I had to go have another MRI with imaging, and I was out feeding the cows, and happened, Usually my cell phone won't work, but it did that day. So and I, I answered it, and it was Dr. Smith. And he said, Tom, I hate to tell you this, but I believe it's cancer. But Karen wasn't there at the time, so I got on the phone and called her and gave her the, the news that I had just received. So, Well, I promised God that we wouldn't question him, that we, in fact, would never question him about anything, and we would never say the word why. Why has this happened to us or anything? That was just not going to be in our vocabulary. So we wanted God's will to be done, and we were going to try to do God's will no matter how difficult it was. Well, the things got to move, and the ball got to really rolling. The orthopedist sent Tom to a bone oncologist in February of 2017. Right after that, a biopsy was done of his shoulder, and then Dr. Price sent Tom to Dr. Rezazadeh, who we call Dr. Rez, and that happened nine days after that. Then Dr. Rez, who is a specialist for renal cell carcinoma, or kidney cancer, 
and then Tom had to go see his urologist. Dr. Goodwin, he's the one who had be taking my kidney out. So we went to see him and we had to go see him and we talked to him and he was talking about immunotherapy, the success they've had with it and you know how it was really working well. But he also I had to go have a, a brain scan that day. So when he said I had to have a brain scan, I said, okay, I've got a question. What if they see anything? He said, if they see one cell of cancer, you will not have your kidney removed and you will have nine months to live. So that was a, a, a real shock when I heard that. That was a, more so than hearing I had cancer because that seemed so definitive if something, mm -hmm. if it was there. So we prayed and prayed and prayed oh, after yeah. that big mm -hmm. time. And then two weeks after that meeting, with Dr. Goodwin, then Tom had his left kidney removed. Now, when I went to see Dr. Rez for the first time, it was at the Norton Cancer Institute in Louisville. And we, what, we pulled up, we had him valet park our car. When we got out and we started in, we grabbed each other's hands as we walked up through the aisle to go to the elevator to go up to the fourth floor. We got off at the fourth floor and you take a left and they have a little waiting room and a big waiting room and uh, it was just all people of all sorts and kinds and ages and you walked in and the thing about this place is not just Dr. Rez, it was about all types of cancer that they worked on. So I went in, got called back, they drew blood, went back out and sat down and when they called us to go back to the consultation room, it's a long hallway. It just seemed like a long walk. <laughs> Real long. And we walked back and my brother was with us on this one too. And we went back and got in the room, and uh, Dr. Rez walked in and said, uh, who's the farmer? And I said, that's me. Hmm. And I said, this is my wife, Karen, this is my brother, John. And then he sat on the table like where the patients usually sit, and he sat down, and the first thing he says is, you have a tumor in your shoulder. It is not curable. It will kill you. You have some time to live. And I replied, we believe in miracles. Hmm. First thing out of my mouth of that. We were given four options to start with. One of them was almost killing you with chemo and hoping you made it. And, and, and he said the chances of it working was very slim. Oh, yeah. And the other two weren't very good. And he said the first and the fourth option was you could be in a clinical trial. And that was the one that we decided to go with. And it's a clinical trial and it's called immunotherapy. Well, the clinical trial was called actually phase 3b4 safety trial of nivolumab combined with ipilimumab in subjects with previously untreated advanced or metastatic renal cell carcinoma and this clinical trial was sponsored by bristol myers squibb nivolumab is commonly known uh, as Opdivo, if you've seen commercials on TV, uh, I know last year around Christmas time there was a commercial running with Opdivo in it. Well, that was one of the drugs that they put him on. Uh, the two cancer meds had worked in cases of melanoma, and doctors knew that they worked in those patients that had that kind of cancer. It had been proven. However, in kidney cancer, the verdict was still out. They were not, these drugs were not approved um, for kidney cancer by the FDA. And longevity after using the two meds remained unknown. Now, the purpose of the study was to test the effectiveness, the safety, and tolerability of investigational drugs for the treatment of advanced renal cell carcinoma. And the things to know before deciding to take part in the clinical trial or research study is they tell you the main goal of regular medicine is to help that patient. But when you're in a clinical trial, it's far different. The main goal of a research study is to learn things to help the patients in the future, not necessarily to help you, mm. but to help people in the future. Mm. My cancer treatment began on April 5th of 2017. That was the first day of my infusion. We reported back to Norton Cancer Institute and had to go up to the third floor for this. And when I walked in, I took my shoes off. I just They had to weigh you because everything they did after that, they weighed you and they, what they made up was downstairs. 
for you individually according to your weight. So we went in, after the, I weighed, we went into the room where you stay. They had a reclining chair where they, you could lay back or sit and they could put the IV in. So we were there, we did that, and they, we went in the room, we sat down, and from the time we got there to the time we left was seven hours. Mm. It took that long for them to make the field, make it up, give me one injection, then I had to wait so many minutes to get the other injection. Well, the first day, everything went fine. I had no wheel effects. I didn't feel anything. Everything was great. I felt just normal. I went back after 28 days. I went back on May the 3rd to get the second treatment. Same process. Weighed me again. You know, they made up the stuff. We sat there for the, about seven hours again. So everything went fine on the second treatment. No, no ill effects whatsoever. Then I was supposed to get the third treatment. They canceled it because I had a cough, and they gave me a CT scan, I guess, to check me out and, and all that. So when I did get my third treatment, it was June the 2nd, and that treatment, I, when I first got home, I had, it wasn't bad. But by Father's Day weekend, I was back in the hot. I had, we went up there to have uh, the scans done again after the treatment, and we had the scans, and I was at this time. I was already starting to go downhill, and we were we just left the hospital. We hadn't had anything to eat. We were going to go get something to eat, and we got a phone call from the clinical trial nurse saying, "Where are you?" And Karen said, "We are still in Louisville. We were just getting to get something to eat." Well, don't go home. Go to Norton Hospital. Check in the emergency room. They'll have a room for you sometime, but just go to Norton Hospital and check in the emergency room. They had gotten your lab work. They had gotten my back. lab work back before we'd gotten home, and they said, you need to go to the hospital. Mm. Well, we got to the hospital. We sat in the emergency room for a while, and then we went to the room. And once we got to the room, it was doctor after doctor after doctor. And at the time, I didn't know what was going on when we were there. Later on, I found out that I'd had many, many side effects. So some of them like, gave me a stroke, meningitis, and... It just you had every, about fifteen to twenty yeah, side effects. Yeah, from this. So I, I had no idea what was going on. Well, after I went to the hospital, I stayed there and they gave me these tests and scanned my brain and stuff. Also, I went home, and from then, from about then until almost September, I was worthless. <laughs> I <laughs> laid on the sofa with my back to people. I didn't want anything to eat. I didn't look outside. I didn't do anything. I just, I was pitiful. I mean, I felt sorry for Karen because she'd ask me what I'd want to eat and I'd tell her nothing. Mm. I just didn't feel like eating. I couldn't do anything. And I didn't know this, but Karen told me, she said, I don't know if he's dying or not. Mm. Well, I told no, a friend that. I told a friend from church that because I was just inconsolable sometime. And then I remember I was with one of my best friends at church, and I said, I really don't know if Tom's dying or not. I can't, I can't tell. He acts like, it is, like he is, but I don't know if he is. Well, Tom, as you went through that, and certainly recovery, but let's talk a little about your recovery. That was nothing short of a miracle, actually. No. But your trials... As a couple is not over, Karen, uh, you were diagnosed with congestive heart failure in 2018. And on top of that, you suddenly lost your brother and your sister only three days apart. Yes. Um, most likely, my congestive heart failure was brought on by the flu. At least that's what the doctors think. Uh, it attacked my heart muscle, and that was back in January of 2018. Um, I was, I had the flu for two weeks, and then following that, I just didn't seem to get better. And finally, Tom said, you have got to go do something. Well, I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure, and my road back to recovery has been miraculous. It's, it's been actually really, it's gone well. Uh, my heart was functioning at uh, 20% what they call ejection fraction in, in the cardiologist language, but I was unable to do normal day-to-day -day activities. All I felt like doing was laying on the couch. It was, I, I had always measured my 
my life each day with how much did I accomplish that day. And for me not to feel like doing anything was not acceptable in my mind. But anyway, they scheduled for me to get a defibrillator implant on June the 4th, 2018. And I have four amazing cardiologists. Um, I actually see the head doctor at the heart failure clinic in Louisville. And I also see a special nurse practitioner whom I taught in elementary school. No kidding. And she's taken such good care of me. The mm. two of those together are just amazing. Mm. Uh, they're quite a tandem, that's for sure. I credit God and give God all the glory for placing these extraordinary people in my lives and in my path. And my heart is now functioning in the normal range. No more 20%. I'm up to 50% now. And mm -hmm. that's, I'll always be on my heart meds. That's not going to change. Mm -hmm. And they may even up them. But I am doing great. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the next part of that question... <laughs> That you, uh, yes, my world was severely shaken when my brother Brooks passed away in August of this year. Um, he had had a general decline since his wife died two years ago, Susie, and he hadn't taken care of himself properly. And he was, we, it was something we were expecting. We didn't expect it exactly the day that it happened, but we were expecting it. We buried Brooks on October 22nd, oh, excuse me, August 22nd, and my only sister, Sharon, died three days after that. Well, it was horrendous. <laughs> uh, we were really, really close, and we talked daily, either by email or by phone. Um, just... We were just so close. She told me all about her family members. I told her all about mine, what was going on. Or we just talked about nothing. But we just we just had a great relationship. And I still mourn their death so much. I miss them horribly. And I can't even believe I'm able to talk about it right now without crying. But it is, it's been really bad. <laughs> you know, Karen talked about her recovery has gone well. And Tom... Your story really took an uptick, too, as well. And um, after you went through that very, very time period in which you were just almost lifeless, then, then you improved very dramatically to where you are today, right? Yes, yes, I did. I mean, my uh, saving grace and strength has come through the merciful Father. I mean, I, yes. I, I know that I know that our family members and are very supportive, the church family, the friends and neighbors, and... And I, the cards that I received through this process were dumbfounding to me. I, I mean, it's not just like one or two. They continued and continued and continued. People just kept sending more for cards for, for, for years. And they would always have a prayer card. A lot of them would have prayer cards in it. Hmm. And I just can't imagine, you know, that just, until you go through something like this and you get that support, you don't know what it's like. Hmm. I mean, it was very, very it just kept you going. Didn't know that people cared that much. It was humbling. It was very humbling. Mm -hmm. And then when I got like that in June, of course, I couldn't do anything. So my friends and neighbors did everything. They planted my crops. They cut my hay, raked and bailed my hay because I couldn't do anything. From then until September, I don't know if I hardly got out of the house hardly. It was just, you know, it was so bad. I was, I was just so weak. I couldn't do anything. And when I was at my sickest, when I was laying in there like that, I would, I would talk to Karen. And I just, I just bust out crying, and she said, "What is the matter?" And I said, "I'm afraid I won't go to heaven." And it was, it was, it was a scary thought. The thought of not going to heaven was more than I could stand. But. You know, Karen, she helped me through everything. We talked about it and everything, and it was it got me through where I was. And the, you know, we talked about the Our Father and stuff before. And the the hardest part about the Our Father to me was always Thy will be done. Mm -hmm. It was hard for me, but I knew that that was that's His will. And I don't know why God has done what He has for me. I keep thinking there's something He wants me to do that I haven't done, and I just hope that that's what I'm doing is fulfilling what He wants me to do. I suspect you're doing that today when you're mm -hmm. sharing that good news, yes. Yeah. 
I've been told many times by an elderly lady that we met at Mississippi State where John Wright played basketball that she, she lost her husband to cancer. They had a big farm, and, and she lost her husband to cancer and, and everything. And she told me, she said, you're going to be a witness to someone. Mm. And I never did really know what that meant. But she said, mm. you're going to be a witness to someone. You're going to touch somebody. Mm. So I hope that that's what I've done. You know, my, my, my purpose is to love and serve and honor God and, and to serve other people. I mm. think that's, that's what we're supposed to do, and hopefully that's what I can do. And would that, would that be your message, the two of you, to those who would be suffering adversities in their lives, just to do those very things? Maybe yeah. so. I, I don't know. I'm not one to give advice to anyone. <laughs> Honestly, I can tell you what's been my saving grace, and maybe someone might want to try something that I've done, but I, I'm not that great at giving advice to anyone outside my family. Now, I tell them all the time, <laughs> but... Um, my saving grace has come from the God of mercy. My friends have been amazing. Our church family is so powerful. Folks in the, this caring community have supported us in an unbelievable way. People of all faiths, folks everywhere have lifted us up in prayer. It's been, it's been an amazing journey, honestly. And another thing that I think has been my saving grace are some of the books that I've read in the last few years. And I would like to mention those. Uh, one of the books that I've read a couple times, it's at least two inches thick. It is The Diary of St. Faustina, Divine Mercy in My Soul. This book has had a major impact on my life. The second book I'd like to mention is called 33 Days to Morning Glory. It's a do-it-yourself retreat in preparation for Marian consecration. I love Mary, and I have a, a loving devotion to Mary. That book has been profound. Then there are two, two books, um, St. Padre Pio healing prayer books that we've uh, used through these last two and a half to three years. And um, there was a lady that her husband died of cancer and she she approached me when she found out that Tom had cancer and she gave me one of those prayer books and since she did that for me then I have ordered those prayer books for other people in the community and passed them along there's some wonderful prayers in those books and they comfort you and you can pray for so many people uh, you know there's even a special prayer in there uh, for people in purgatory and it's not just about people with cancer it's about people that are suffering from all all types of illnesses and pain and um, another book that I that has uh, meant a lot to me is a book that I use uh, one of my friends at church uses this book too we use it every Monday when we go to adoration um, I use it first. I'm in at 5 o'clock at Adoration every Monday, and then my friend Darlene comes in at 6 o'clock, and she, I always pass the book on to her. Mm -hmm. We always share that book. I feel like my Eucharistic Adoration is not complete if I'm not um, reading prayers and litanies from that book because it's, it's a, uh, you know, just prayers for the Eucharist. So those things have been my strength. And there's one more thing I would like to mention that I feel like I've gained strength from. I attended, uh, several years ago, I attended a Catholic mission that was out at Flaherty at uh, St. Martin of Tours. And we had a priest that came in from California. And um, he, I, I just, this, this uh, mission was just so meaningful for me. And I, I know in my heart that I was touched with the Holy Spirit during that that meeting. It was a three day meeting where we'd go back, you know, each night for to to learn more. And I I was touched so profoundly one night that I felt like I almost fell over to the left. I fell sideways and I had to gather myself. But I felt like that has strengthened my my relationship with the Holy Spirit in such a way that now 
the Holy Spirit is just like one of my buddies. He's mm. with me every day. And I, I didn't feel like I knew the Holy Spirit that much before. I would pray to the Father or the Son. But now the Holy Spirit is just an integral part of my mm. of my my talking and my prayers. Well, in closing, we you know, we opened the show about your life, your story about life, about death and new life and you know, in John's Gospel in chapter 16, Jesus says, "In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world." Tom and Karen, after experiencing so much sadness, so much sickness and and so much death. Cheer did come into your world on October the 8th, 2019, in a glorious way. I'll I'll let you tell us about that cheer in your life. Well, pure joy came into our lives on October 8th. Our first granddaughter was born in Louisville. It's uh, Riley's little girl, well, big girl. (laughs) Uh, Her name is Emerson Jade Beanock, and she weighed 8 pounds and 13 ounces, and she's just absolutely wonderful. She's (laughs) gorgeous, and we love her so much. She's six weeks old now. Mm, Great, great. Are you a proud uh, grandpa? Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Now, she is a girl. Will she be able to drive a tractor when she grows up? If she wants. There you go. There you go. Well, that's great. Well, Karen and Tom, the story of your lives has certainly uh, touched our lives. Uh, the story of your heartaches, the story of your joy. Uh, actually, that's your gift to us this Christmas season, and we want to thank you for sharing your gift of faith and your gift of hope and love with us and all of our listening audience. And may God continue to share his strength and his mercy uh, with you and your beautiful family. Thank you, Greg. We have no idea what is next on the horizon for us, and but we do know we will not walk alone. We have the love of God, the compassion of Jesus, and the guiding compass of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for allowing us to tell you our story today. Thank you. Be great. Thank you, Greg. You've been listening to discussions on Meade County Catholic Radio, broadcasting from Brandenburg, Kentucky, on WLHN 95.3. I'm Deacon Greg Bevan. We now return to our regularly scheduled programming, Now in Progress.